Welcome to Star and Miss. This episode concludes a series dedicated to understanding Miss life cycles. In the first two episodes, we presented a model explaining the distribution of Miss motive. In this episode, I will explain how to predict the lifetime of motives and determine on average their age. We apply our model to present the data and to some ancient myths to determine the ticking time of a mythic clock, just as a molecular clock uses the metrician rate of genes to estimate evolutionary timelines, a mythic clock assumes that Miss motive evolve relatively steadily. So our model of how Miss motive evolve can be run in thousands of different ways. It's a probabilistic model. What you are seeing now is a simulation with the best parameter that best match the real-world data. A motive appears and spreads locally to its neighbors, much like a virus that affects a small community but doesn't cause a global pandemic. Then after some time, it disappears. The image on the right is like a heat map. Instead of indicating the presence or absence of a simple motive, it displays the average presence over 50 steps, providing a better sense of the motive stability. To understand why that balance is so important, let's deliberately simulate the dynamics at its two extreme. First, let's increase the contagion level for miss, which we refer to as a birth probability. As you can see, the motive spread explosively, packing the entire grid. Every tradition eventually shares the same motive as its neighbors. In our virus analogy, it's a pandemic that affects and infects the entire population. The result? The myth has a very long lifetime, but it lacks uniqueness. Now, if we go to the other extreme and turn the contagion level way down, basically nothing happens. A new motive appears and then vanishes almost immediately. Each motive is almost unique in this regime, but none of them live long enough to matter. So after exploring the extreme, let us examine a finer structure. This plot summarize the result of millions of simulation. And the black arrows highlight the specific point, the best fit, where the model parameters most closely match the real world data. Don't need to worry about the details on the axis. The only thing that matter is that one single point. And that this is where it gets exciting. The best fit lies at a tipping point between motives that always vanish and are generally locally spread and ones that spread to everyone. In this model, we can even make a quantitative prediction. On average, a motive has a lifetime of roughly 200 years. Now, that number is based on the model's internal clock and you will see how we calibrate that clock in one moment. But it shows that the model can produce concrete, testable result. This begs the question, why would MIS exist in, in such an unstable state? The answer might start with an insight from anthropology. One of the giants of the field, Claude Lévi-Strauss, argued that culture are driven by a fundamental need to differentiate themselves from their neighbors. This gives us the drive for uniqueness. Building on that insight, my hypothesis is that this drive confronts every tradition with a dilemma. The myth must be unique to satisfy this drive for uniqueness, but they also need to survive over time. 
And I believe the distribution of, of myths we see in the real world is a result of this very compromise. But this hypothesis in turn creates a new puzzle. How can a single tradition, which only knows what its direct neighbors are doing, possibly find this perfect global balance? Is there a simple local rule that they can follow? As we'll see, there might be one. So how can a single culture with no global view find that perfect balance between uniqueness and survival? The answer might be a simple, almost elegant local rule. If a culture shares a motif with roughly one third of its nearest neighbor, it hits this optimal point. Why? Because the motive is common enough to feel reinforced and stable, but not so common that it loses its uniqueness. With this simple rule of thumb, the entire system can naturally settle near that critical tipping point, achieving the perfect compromise between a long lifetime and a distinct identity. Now, is this the definitive answer? It's impossible to say for sure at this point. This is my best interpretation of the model's data, and I wanted to share it with you as food for thought. There might be other, even more effective local rules at play. But it's an amazing possibility that such a complex global pattern could emerge from such simple local rules. Dating myth motive is a problem that I have long considered, and I'm glad to present a first approach to it. As we'll see, the method is quite straightforward, given the model of motive life cycles presented in the last two videos. The difficulties will arise when feeding the model with ancient data. The graph on this slide shows the distribution of the number of tradition based on real-world data. The blue curve represents the distribution of all myths motive in the database. The red curve is a distribution restricted to motives known to have existed approximately 2,000 years ago, including ancient sources from China, Egypt, Rome, and Soma, all located in Eurasia and Africa as we lack all data from other continents. You can see that the two curves have different shapes. This is because over the course of 2000 years, motifs with shorter lifetimes tend to disappear, leaving only the long life motifs to survive. We'll use this difference in shape to estimate the conversion factor between our simulation steps and really is. It's essential to acknowledge the practical limitation of this ancient data. It is a strong restriction to use only Eurasian and African source. Also, the data comes from different period and the 2000 year average is a rough approximation. And I think the most major source of uncertainty is how myths were preserved up to the present time, either primarily through uh, oral transmission or through continuous written tradition as seen in Greece and, and China. And we must really keep this limitation in, in, in mind. The core assumption that we'll use is that the fundamental process of mispropagation was the same in the past as it is today. Therefore, if we could go back 2000 years and take a snapshot of all the myths existing at that moment, its distribution curve would have the same shape as a modern blue curve does today. The ancient red curve is what remains after two millennia, having filtered out the short-lived motive 
from that original snapshot. Let's walk through exactly how we derive that conversion factor. The overall goal is to artificially age the motifs with our model represented by the original distribution shown in the blue curve at the bottom left. The core assumption, again stated at the top right of the slide, is that the distribution of mist 2000 years ago had the same initial shape as the distribution today. The optimization proceed in two steps. First, we start from the distribution in blue. We let the simulation age the data set incrementally. For each step, we compare the shape of the age data to the shape of the ancient data and record the resulting error value. Second, we analyze all the recorded error values to determine the single simulation step where the error was at its absolute minimum. This point is our best fit. In our case, the best fit occurred after 1,600 simulation steps. This gives us our conversion factor. 1,600 steps in our model is equivalent to roughly 2,000 years of real-world history. Here are the results of the modeling using ancient data. The graph shows the percentage of motifs that according to the model were present some years before the present time. When observe a factor of 2.2 difference between the light blue curve representing the best fit for ancient Greece and ancient China and the rest of the ancient civilization represented in dark blue. The red curve corresponds to the average. In other words, ancient Chinese and Greek motifs have better withstood the test of time than those in language that are mostly forgotten and have been propagated orally for much of the time. While this result show considerable uncertainty, this suggests that approximately 10% of the motifs may have lived for over 3,000 years. As I mentioned, a model is there to be improved. So, let's improve it. Our model does a great job of explaining the life cycle for most myths, but it isn't perfect. It begins to break down when we examine the most widely distributed motifs, what statisticians would call the tail of the distribution. And when we look closer at this specific region of our data, the tail containing the most widespread motifs, we find something interesting. This area has a disproportionately high number of sky-related motifs. These widespread motifs include sun-moon motifs and a motif about the separation of sky and earth. We also find recurring ideas such as a rainbow being a, a giant serpent or tales of powerful thunderbirds. And very importantly, this group includes a widespread motif of star being seen as people, which contains the stories of the Pleiades as a group of people. To see exactly what's happening with the data, let's zoom in on the tail section, technically by using what's called a log scale. When we do this, we see precisely where our models start to fail. For motifs with more than 100 to 115 instances, the real-world data diverge uh, from our model's prediction. This suggests that these super widespread motifs behave differently. Therefore, we can significantly enhance the fit by developing a new single model that is a weighted mixture a superposition of two distinct models. Here's how it works. 
The principal model provides 90% of the weight of the, this new mixture. The second model, which provides the remaining 10% of the weight, has a slightly higher birth probability. When we can combine them in this way, the new curve fits the data significantly better, as you can see here. With this episode, we conclude the presentation on modeling myths and folk tales. I hope it wasn't too difficult to follow with the many plots. In our next episode, we'll discuss stories in East Africa, Europe, and Southeast Asia, where the Pleiades are a hen with its chicks, and we dive into the history of the domestication of that animal. And here are some references if you want to dig further. Stay tuned. Bye-bye.